Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And the name of the servant was Malchus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This scene of the Passion takes place in the garden immediately after the kiss of the traitor Judas. With this horrible betrayal, things suddenly are going badly for the apostles. Filled with enthusiasm from Palm Sunday, renewed at the ordination, participating in the first Holy Mass, that's the Last Supper, and receiving the intimate embrace of our blessed Lord and Holy Communion, the apostles must surely have thought they were invincible. Oh, how our blessed Lord must have glowed on that Holy Mass, that first Holy Mass. Did He not say with desire, I have desired to eat this Pasch with you before I suffer. All the warnings of the impending arrest, trial, scourging, suffering, and death fell on deaf ears and seemed to be impossible. All this week, His Majesty had befuddled the elders and scribes time and time again. He spoke of things of time and eternity, of church and state, of heaven and hell, he seemed unstoppable, unbeatable, irrefutable, untouchable. They tried to do him in more than once without any effect at all. They could not arrest him. They could not touch him. Who would dare to cause him any harm? Surely this garden would open the way back to the other lost garden of paradise. When we hear of prophecies yet to be fulfilled, do we not feel the same wonder? How could this be? How is this possible? Put yourself in those people's shoes back then. Think of their response to the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple. Oh, surely you're mistaken. How can this possibly happen? When we think of the prophecies of our time in the future, we wonder, can it get worse? We wonder, how is this going to happen? How is this possible? With that in mind, we can understand a little bit of the apostles' disposition when they were in the garden. Instead of praying and preparing for the spiritual battle that lay before them, the apostles fell into arguing amongst themselves who was the greatest and who would do what in the kingdom that seemed to be unfolding in their presence. Or they just daydreamed and fell asleep. Here is the misstep. Everybody knows what it is. They failed to pray properly. If only they had entered into the Holy Mass more deeply when they had the chance. They were at the first Mass. Offered by our Lord Himself. Now it was too late. Here before them stood His Majesty, having prayed the longer, now soaking with blood and sweat, being kissed by one of their own. And to think this man had just received Holy Communion with the same tongue and mouth that he kissed our Lord with. They witnessed the same infamous betrayal in the history of the world. They witnessed the most infamous betrayal in the history of the world. Right before their very eyes, our blessed Lord was being arrested. He did not pass through their midst. Hmm. It seems that he could be stopped after all. It seems he's being beaten after all. He's being held and bound. Something different is going on here. What to do? What are we supposed to do? Imagine being one of those apostles. Well, Peter, the first pope, the head of the apostolic college, takes up the sword to defend his majesty, striking wildly and all alone at the enemy. And they were many. It's amazing if you stop and think about it. The Judases of history always have a very large following. Those who remain faithful always seem to be way outnumbered. But here's a lesson. 
There's obviously some self-sacrifice here on Peter's part, but it was the wrong kind. In a normal battle, he would have been cut down very quickly, but our Lord prevented it. He acted not according to God's ways, but man's, and thus he failed. Thus, his majesty's rebuke, Jesus therefore said to Peter, Put up thy sword into the scabbard. The chalice which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? What is he saying? I will show you how to gain the victory, Peter. Follow me. We will gain the victory by way of wood, not swords. The victory is by way of wood, not swords. All who choose the natural and worldly paths to stop evil, they will not solve it. This is a spiritual war that requires a victory on higher planes. Thus, His Majesty stated, Then Jesus saith to him, All that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot ask my Father, and he will give me presently more than twelve legions of angels? Although Judas in his malice and treachery has more followers than Christ, once again, it always seems to be the case. The betrayers always have more on their side, it seems. Maybe that's why they betray, thinking they had the advantage. Anyway, although Judas in his malice and treachery has many more followers than Christ, a multitude with weapons no less, we need not fear. The supernatural power of God will always gain the victory if we use His standard, the cross, the cross. In the time of the prophet Isaiah, the Assyrian king Sennacherib came and surrounded Jerusalem under King Hezekiah. The scriptures tell us, And the angel of the Lord went out and slew in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000 in one night. And they arose in the morning, and behold, they were all dead corpses. 185,000. Numbers mean nothing in this war. On the other hand, how we pray, how we suffer, what we offer to God on the cross can make all the difference in the world. The apostles failed to pray. They did not negotiate with God for the victory when they had an opportunity, and that is when they attended the first Mass. If you have something going on in your life that's not right, go and first kneel down at the Mass and negotiate it with God. What am I supposed to do? Let me win this victory for you. I'm going to pay with this price. I'm going to do this, this, and this. Start negotiating with God, and you will win the victory. Finally, let's turn to the sword that Peter wielded. Since our battles are first and foremost spiritual, as Sennacherib learned the hard way, waking up and his whole entire army is dead, we can see that this sword symbolizes higher things. That's the sword of Peter. First, the sword could be taken to be that of the angel, protecting paradise. The one that was preventing Adam and Eve from coming back in. The apostles were thinking the door was opening to Eden, that a kingdom of paradise was in the often. But then out comes the sword that draws blood and stops ears from hearing. Instead of entering into the kingdom, they end up fleeing for their very lives. How many movements over the centuries promised paradise on earth? an end in bloodshed, deafness to God's ways, and more and more division. Many. Communism is just one example. There are communists in the church, too, who think they can make paradise come here on earth, following after the lead of these apostles, trying to use a natural way to bring in an Eden. 
Nothing but bloodshed, nothing but deafness to God's ways, and more divisions will result from these sorts of efforts. Second of all, and very relevant to us, is this. The sword is the truth, the very word of God that has been revealed or handed down to us through the scriptures and tradition. Notice it was wielded by Peter, the first pope, the custodian and preserver of truth. That's the pope's job. He's to keep and preserve the truth handed down by Christ himself. This sword is spoken of by St. John and St. Paul. St. John in the Apocalypse says that from his mouth, that is Christ, came out a sharp two-edged sword. St. Paul says, take unto you the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In another place, he says, for the Word of God is living and effectual and more piercing than any two-edged sword and reaching under the division of the soul and the spirit of the joints also and the marrow and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the spiritual sword must be used in accord with God's holy will, that is, with charity, meekness, and humility. If we do not do this, we will easily strike off the ears of our listeners, making them deaf to the good this truth offers them. Now, it seems to me, seems to me, various traditional, put quotes around that, traditional-minded Catholics and their various blog sites do this all the time. They hit hard with truths of the faith, but in a way that is not filled with charity, meekness, and humility, the humility of Christ. Thus, they end up lopping off the ears of their listeners, requiring a miracle of grace to convert these people. How many of us have had that experience? Good intentions, in other words. Efforts to clear our consciences are not enough to bludgeon somebody with the truth. It has to be done as God wills it. And that's with charity, humility, and meekness. Like Peter swinging the sword wildly and not producing any lasting effects, no saving of souls through his efforts, so do these people do. Think about it. From the gospel, our Lord seemed to side with the enemies by working his last miracle of healing upon one of their number, the one that actually reached out to grab a hold of him first, Malchus. And it says in Luke's gospel, St. Luke, that when he had touched his ear, he healed him. Let us therefore form habits of prayer and meditation of negotiating with His Majesty on the wood of the cross at the Holy Mass. All of our trials in life, let's go there first and work it out with Him. We will then not easily betray Him or His holy cause, and we will more readily and more effectively wield the sword of truth in humility, meekness, and charity for the salvation of souls. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.